Welcome back to Sherlock Holmes versus Jack the Ripper with the Rude Man. And uh, we just visited the crime scene of Annie Chapman. And I discovered that I missed something. So let's go look at the deduction. If you remember during the investigation, I, I found uh, that she had some rings that were maybe torn off. And I discovered that, but I didn't put it in this board. So we need to put it in the board. Here it is right here. We need to add this into our deductive board. And then recent large scrape on the first phalanx of the middle finger. The victim struggled against the murderer. The victim must have worn one or more rings. The victim had arthritis. I think it's this one. And our conclusion that she took the rings off, well, they, they were bruised pretty bad. So we're thinking that the murderer ripped them off. So the murderer stole her rings. I hear a noise coming from the street, Watson. The authorities are arriving. It's time for us to go. Holmes has been locked away in his room for days, always saying the same things. I'm thinking, Watson. Very good, Watson. As you wish, Watson. But I am thinking too, so much so that I can't sleep. Annie Chapman. Good Lord. All right. Um, there's something I've kind of been missing, and that is that we have notes that I haven't been looking at. Now, these notes are by Sherlock himself. So, and there may be more information in here than than maybe you know we missed during you know searching the crime scene. Let's find out. Hanbury Street, September eighth, eighteen eighty eight, the murder of Annie Chapman. Investigation into the courtyard. The apprentice has nothing of interest. The footprints on the ground are all mixed up. There's nothing to be drawn. Nonetheless. Nothing dragged along the ground, no deep footprints, and no visible drops of blood. The victim was killed here, and more, there doesn't seem to have been a struggle. The pipe comes out of the ground under the tap. We can see a puddle. Two feet from this puddle is a leather apron folded in two. Now, we did see that leather apron laying on the ground, but he concluded that it wasn't part of the deal. This apron is soaked with water and leaves a deep impression in the ground. It was left in the water for several hours and was left on the ground for some time. This is of great interest. The, wa the water in the puddle under the tap is clean, not the slightest trace of blood. The killer didn't come to wash his hands here. Two vertical palings are stained with blood. One of the two is sit situated not far from the head. The blood is a dozen inches from the ground. The victim was currently lying down when she had her throat slit, but was still alive. The other is the wall to the left of the stairs. These bloodstains on the wall tell me that the murderer certainly wasn't behind the head of the victim when he slit her throat. Otherwise, his body would have screened it and received these drops of blood. Furthermore, he wouldn't have had any room to move. The piece of envelope that I found near the head smells of 90% proof alcohol. On the front of this piece is a seal accompanied by the words Sussex Regiment in relief and in blue. The Royal Sussex Regiment seal is and is a handwritten letter M underneath which is the letter S in the same writing. A red postmark above says London 28, August 1888. Inside this envelope are three white pills near the feet of the victim. Three objects are found. A piece of coarse muslin, a long slender comb with small, close teeth, and a small pocket comb in a paper holder. These objects are ne neatly arranged one on top of each other. These objects are those of a woman, certainly the victim. The murderer probably got these objects out of the pocket of his victim and arranged them carefully on the ground in an orderly manner. Fascinating. 
This way of proceeding reveals a very particular state of mind at the moment of the crime. Examination of the victim. Watson was able to place the time of the crime before 4.30 in the morning. The tongue is swollen, like the Buck Rose victim. This one was partially strangled before being subjected to the assaults of her aggressor's blade. Two incisions to the neck from the right to the left, one going around the neck, the other stopping in the middle and being pushed more. He wanted to decapitate this woman. The wound that goes around the neck is shredded and not all of one go. The man inflicted it in little jerks with a very sharp blade. Contusions on the face, a large bruise, but presumably old. On the right temple, others are found on the left side of the face. Contusions on the face, a large bruise, but presumably, but presumably old on the right temple. Others are found on the left side of the cheek. There's less on the right side. The stomach was totally opened and the aban and the abdom the stomach was totally opened and the abdominal wall separated in two loose parts to the left and to the right of the body. The intestines were detached and placed above the victim's shoulder in order to allow access to the abdominal cavity. It seems that he removed a number of organs. The victim's uterus is missing. These organs were removed. They weren't ripped out. Quite the contrary, the incisions were precise and controlled, as there are no secondary cuts. It wasn't trial and error, and, the, and he only cut what was necessary. It's the work of an expert. There is very little blood on the clothing. The killer knew what he was doing. Here is the kind of tool that he probably used for his crime. A very sharp knife with a long and rigid blade. A very sharp knife with a long and rigid blade. Perhaps the victim's left hand has a wound. A very sharp knife with a long and rigid blade. Perhaps the same as the one that slit her throat. The victim's left hand was a wound. The victim's left hand has a wound. A recent scratch. The victim must have worn a large ring or several small ones and someone pulled them off forcefully. Certainly the murderer. This information will be certainly valuable. All righty. Okay, let's look around, see what we've got to see around here. Look, there's that green piece of glass that we found. Holmes examined the broken jar that belonged to Finley's tenant. I wonder what this substance is. I don't recognize the odor. Formalin, Watson. This jar contained formalin. Interesting, don't you think? Hmm. I've been waiting for something for days. Just the tiniest bit of news that would make sense of this whole matter. But there's nothing, neither from the press nor the police. Unless Inspector Abeline is holding on to some information without realizing its importance, which is quite possible. It is time for you to return to the police station in Whitechapel, Watson. And didn't you tell me that you had a matter to take care of it? Take advantage of it to learn more about this pill and its contents. Ah, but Holmes, it's late. And spending another night in this district is hardly my idea of entertainment. I know, Doctor, but we don't have any choice. Time is against us. Take your pistol in case you run into any troublesome characters. Fine, as you wish, Holmes. So, we're going back to Whitechapel. All right, let's see. We need to go to the cobbler. Whitechapel, night of September 11th. Hello. Good evening, Mr. Solomonovich. 
Good evening, Doctor. What a pleasure to see you again. I am uh, want to ask you about this Pizer. Did he turn himself into the cops? Tell me, did John Pizer turn himself into the police? Things unfolded as they should. Look in the newspaper, the daily news from today. Okay. And I came to ask you about that harness. Have you finished converting the harnesses? Yes, just now. I got a little behind because of all the commotion. What commotion? Commotion? Don't you start. Three days ago, the very afternoon that you passed by, there was a chase throughout the neighborhood. Hundreds of people were chasing one man, claiming he was responsible for the murders these last few days. Schmontz! It was awful! I hope those maniacs didn't catch him. Better the police should. Hmm. All right. Farewell, Isaac. Goodbye, Doctor. Okay, here's the uh, article he's talking about. There's a good reason why, without prejudice to the case of the man who is now in custody, the public acceptance of the maniacal theory should be endorsed and encouraged. There is positive danger in the growth of any other opinion at present in Whitechapel. As we have said, the mutilation of bodies, excepting in rare cases to further the murderer's chances of safety, is foreign to the English style and crime. There is a disposition at once, therefore, to set down such atrocities to the credit of some ill-bred and ill-nourished foreigner from the lowest dens of vice in Europe. So, in Whitechapel, there was a rising murmur of ugly foreboding for some of the foreign elemental there. Sheer rumor of the silliest kind was beginning to take an odious precision, and there was a rising in the East End, a Judenhell's more abhorrent than that which abroad is due to religious fan fanaticism. To hate the Jew for his religion, to call him misbeliever, cutthroat dog, and spit upon his Jewish gabardine, even metaphorically is bad enough, but to call him leather apron, and to imply thereby his readiness to murder women and practice anatomy with his knife upon them, is the refinement of cruelty. There was reason to fear till yesterday that the tendency towards thus insulting the Jews of Whitechapel was growing amid the embarrassing perplexity as to the origin of the murders. The police have discouraged this line of suspicion by acting momentarily upon it, and then proving by their release of the Jew whom they arrested that there was no doubt of his innocence. For the happy result, we may look lightly upon the apparently ludicrous error of this arrest. Pizer, the man arrested, was found sitting quietly at home, totally undisturbed by any panic or bloodthirsty demand for the mythical personage leather apron. He is said to be a poor sickly man, whom it was not possible to associate with the assassin, now so eagerly wanted and the reporters seem to have found what the police might easily also have learned, that he had not left his house since Thursday last. Pizer, however, will probably not regret his short detention if it has finally put a stop to this anti-Jewish suspicions. The inquest on the body of Annie Chapman was opened yesterday, but without throwing any new light on the murder. As a result of the investigations of the police into the circumstances contending the murder of Annie Chapman at Whitechapel, several men were arrested yesterday on suspicion. The arrests, which were considered to be of most importance, were those of a Polish Jew named Pizer near the scene of the crime and of a man named Piggott at Gravesend. Pizer was released last evening. But Pickett, being considered to be insane, is to be detained under observation. The, the reason why I'm reading a lot of these is because I'm curious. I don't know, but I'm curious if these are the actual news uh, reports of the time. All right, onward. Thank you for the harness. All right, so the doctor's right across the street, so let's go talk to him. All 
All right, let's see. Um, we have the harnesses for him. So let's give them to him. Good evening, Dr. Gibbons. Dr. Watson. I've got the cane. Did you keep the cane we spoke of last time? I was going to sell it tomorrow, would you believe, having not heard word. Okay. Well, I've got your harness. Here are your harnesses, Doctor. They are top quality, I'd say. Definitely worth the prize of this walking stick. Here, it's yours. All right, thank you. Do you know of formalin? Do you have any formalin here? No, definitely not. They have it in university hospitals to conserve anatomical specimens in jars. But in a little clinic like mine, we don't keep anything but bad memories. Okay. Well, farewell, Doctor. Goodbye, Dr. Watson. Now... I must go to Miss Bella's. Well, we need to go to Bella's, but uh, Sherlock wanted us to ask him one more thing. And that was about the pill. Yes, Doctor? Could you tell me what type of pill this is? Yes, we have those here. It's not really a medication. We give them to patients with chronic respiratory conditions like tuberculosis. Okay. Do you know of Annie Chapman? Did you have a patient by the name of Annie Chapman? The woman killed three days ago. Indeed. She came in the morning of her death. Poor woman. Did you give her these pills? Yes, now that I think of it. She actually came in twice. The first time I gave her an almost empty container without making her pay. She came back during the day and said she dropped the container and stepped on the pills. She wanted to know if I could give her more again without paying. I refused. After she left, a patient who was there told me that he lives at the same place and confided that she had been lying. He saw the pills fall in the tenement's communal kitchen, but the woman immediately wrapped them up in a piece of paper. Where did this paper come from? According to this man, she'd found it near the chimney in the kitchen. Anyone could have thrown that paper there. That envelope can't have anything to do with the murder. Pardon, Doctor? Uh, nothing. I was just talking to myself. All right. Goodbye. Well, farewell, Doctor. Goodbye, Dr. Watson. I must go to Miss Bella's. Okay, so what he's talking about is... Let's see. Items? No. Documents. This piece of paper that Sherlock was talking about is a coincidence that uh, she had it. All right, so let's go to the brothel. All right, and then uh, we need to talk to Bella. And let's see, we've got the cane to give to her. So let's get that ready. Good evening, ma'am. Um, your door was open. Isn't that a little dangerous? Hello, doctor. Don't worry, if the looks of anyone who enters doesn't please me, me and my pistol know how to convince them to leave. You should put that pistol down under the counter. I mean, otherwise you'd have a fight for it with somebody. Um, do you know an Annie Chapman? Do you happen to know Annie Chapman, the poor woman who was killed three days ago? Dark Annie? Pfft, like all the drifters in the area, I've seen her once or twice. With respect to the dead, Annie really was the bottom of the barrel. What do you mean? Well, in our profession, the pretty young ones go out when night has barely fallen and don't have a problem finding takers. But poor girls like Annie or Polly Nichols, who aren't as tender and are often sick, sometimes trudge around for a whole night in the cold and the rain before landing a client. And that doesn't help their appearances either. They don't have much choice about paying for a bed for a few hours, a glass of gin or a hot meal. How terribly sad. <laughs> That's the price of survival in Whitechapel, my angel. One of my girls knew Annie for some time. They bought some jewellery on the black market, I think. Jewellery? How could Annie Chapman have possibly afforded jewellery? <laughs> Luxuries for a woman are always relative to her condition, Doctor. As a matter of fact, it was real cheap junk. 
Annie got three assorted brass rings, I think. <laughs> it's been said I have a memory for jewellery. I wonder why. What about Lucy? What can you tell me about her? Now, Lucy is the gal that brought me here. How is Lucy keeping? She's doing well, Doctor. But believe me, it won't last. Rare are the girls who can build a future in our profession. That's too bad. Um, I've got that cane for you. I found the cane that was stolen from your client. Here it is. Doctor, you are a real saint. I can see that. I'll finally be able to present my bill to this damned painter. If by chance you see him, tell him that a little surprise awaits him here. You bet, I sure will. Now, I have questions about this doctor that's been around. You told me you would give me some information on this Dr. Tumblety. Agreed. He's a Canadian or an American. He parades from time to time through the neighborhood in a 50 guinea suit and acts like a doctor. But for business, he isn't worth it. This damn Yankee hates women. The few times that he was approached by the girls, he spit on them, all the while hurling insults. It would seem that he was hunting for the bad boys. He's looking for trouble, that animal. Does he frequent any pub in particular? Aye, the wasp's nest on Burner Street, I think. A seedy spot even by our standards. All right. Well, thank you. Very well. I shall let you get back to work, Ma. See you soon, my love. All right, let's go see if we can find this pub. The wasp's nest. The wasp's nest. This pub looks even more disreputable than the Golden Lion in Baker Street. Okay, there's our uh, painter. I don't know who that is. Let's go talk to the painter. Good evening, sir. Well, I know you. Why? We met at Miss Poolman's the other day. So you've come to slum it in Whitechapel, eh? Well, uh, what are you talking about? Do you know Dr. Tumblety, a Canadian or American chap? Quite an extravagant dresser. Frequents this pub now and then. Are you intimate? Um, what? No. What do you mean by that? Oh, nothing. Nothing at all. I just wanted to prove my discretion concerning this man, in so much and so far as I know him. You wouldn't like it if one day the tables were turned and everyone was talking about why you were in the borough, isn't that so? Uh, speaking of uh, the madam... As it happens, I saw Miss Pullman recently. She told me that she couldn't wait to see you again. She said something about a surprise that is waiting for you at her establishment. Why, that is some of the best news I've heard, my friend. As thanks, I would like to let you in on a secret. The man that you were talking about, and whom I happen to know by sight, passed by and went through that little door that you see over there. Another man let him in. They weren't together for more than a few minutes, to be sure, eh? All right, thank you. Well, I will continue my search. Ah, love. But what is this person trying to imply? <sighs> this matter is beyond me. All right, well, there's the door. Let's see if we can get in there. Hey, you can't go in there. It's private. Got it? Oh, sorry. What's that? This is the sink where the barmaid puts the glasses to soak. Look, red ink. What's that doing here? The bottle is closed. There must still be some ink inside, and it looks like a glass. The barmaid must have put ink into the sink by mistake. Right. Do I get in your way? Me? Oh, sorry. If you'll excuse me, sir. You're kind of a nice fella. Greetings, my good man. Could I have a pint? 
Was that a yes or a no? Hey, a gov. You know a Mr. Tumblety? I've been told that Dr. Tumblety might be found around here. Is that so? I don't do a roll call of all the drunkards here. I've got my hands full just making sure I get their money. Uh, don't they pay in advance? Don't people pay when they order? Nah, look at that little scribbler there. Completely dead drunk. Tonight's tally is about as long as his arm. If he skips out, I'll be in for a guinea almost. Okay. Uh, can you tell me about that closed door? What's behind that locked door over there? Can I go in? Not likely. And let me be unless you're wanting a drink, got it? All right, thanks. Goodbye, my friend. Oi, that's it. What, you don't like being called friend? Oh, man. You, sir. Good evening, sir. It'll be the coup of my career, Governor said. Ha! <laughs> You'll make loads of dots of the paper, he said. Are you a journalist? You're a journalist? That's so. Tom Bulling at your service. <laughs> the Whitechapel ferret. The wizard with the scoop. You don't appear to be in a state to write anything, my friend. You're mistaken. Whiskey passes through the blood and turns into ink. Simple. <laughs> you see, mugs and inkwells are all the same. Don't you think you should settle your tab and go home? My red ink? Where's my red ink? I won't even pay half a halfpenny if they don't return my red ink. It's my blood you hear. Was he serious? It really is his blood. Very well. I'll be on my way. Right. Well, as it happens, we just found a bottle of red ink, didn't we? So, let's see if this will buy us a little information. You're the best. The boss told me. My red ink. Well, where's she be? Here you go. I found your red ink, my friend. You should settle up and head home. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. The spring-heeled phantom will be revived. Okay. So, let's see if that bought me any um, goodwill with the, with the uh, bartender. Hello? Gov? I got that guy to pay his bill. Here you go. It's on the journalist, my friend. I owe you one. The next one is on me. What'll it be? Nothing, thanks. But I may need your help. I'm trying to get in that door over there. Listen, my friend. I would like you to let me in the door over there. You're a bobby. A peeler? Absolutely not, my friend. I am a doctor. Fine. I owe you this at least. There's a bloke behind that door there. No pity Bluto. Let's just say he wants to lay low for a moment. So I don't think he'll be opening the door just now. Unless... Tell him you have word from Squibby. That'll open the door. But who can say what'll happen when the door closes? The hell does that mean? Goodbye, my friend. Oi, that's it. Yeah, he really doesn't like to be called friend. Let me in. I... I have news from Squibby. But stay calm. And who are you? Where's Squibby? He's out. To be honest, I don't actually know this Squibby chap. I was actually wondering if you knew Dr. Tumblety. A Canadian or American fellow. He came in... Sure we know him. Excellent. Can you... You know about gas? I'm afraid not. I am a doctor. Then I ain't interested. You can be leaving now. But if I find out he snitched to the peelers, I'll find you. Got it? But I can pay you for... Keep your coins for the paupers. Or one of the gas boys who ain't afraid of nothing and knows how to hold his tongue. You bring him to me. I'll meet with you. A gas boy? What the hell does that mean? I, I don't... I don't know. All right, well, I think the only thing we have left is to go to the... Uh police department that uh, Sherlock wanted us to go to. So, let's do that.
Good evening. I hope I'm not disturbing you. Not at all, Doctor. This man, Mr. Richardson, is a witness to the horrid affair at 29 Hanbury Street, the murder of Annie Chapman. We are discussing the relevance of his testimony. His testimony? You're probably not in a position to discuss it with me, but I would like to know more about what you call the relevance of this young man's testimony. Oh, there's no secrecy. It's simply that the testimony given by Mr. Richardson doesn't match the time of death given by the coroner, Dr. Phillips. What was the time of death, according to him? Before half four in the morning. Okay. Other witnesses? My conclusions were the same. Were there any other conflicting testimonies? Well, two other witnesses summoned at the preliminary inquest gave testimony, but in these cases too, the times don't match. Do you remember what it was they said? I didn't question them myself. A colleague of mine took down their statements on paper, but on deciding they were of little use, he tore them up and threw them in the bin. There's no point in being bogged down with useless paperwork. Okay, thanks. I will take my leave, Humphreys. Goodbye, Doctor. All right, so they had information from this guy. May I introduce myself? I'm Dr. Watson. I am... You wouldn't be the chap what writes the detective stories in that there paper. Well, yes, indeed, my stories have been published in the Strand. Go oh, blimey, wanna tell me, old mum? It would seem your testimony is the subject of some debate. Could you tell me what it was about? Ah, uh, they'll be telling you I'm a bit befuddled about the times that I told them. But it can't be so. I knows what I sees and what I don't sees that morning. What did you see, or what didn't you see? And at what time, would you say? I'll tell you this for nothing. It's me old mum who lives at the house where the body was found out back in the garden. She has her shop at the bottom to the right of the stairs. Her door was broken down not too far back because it's a real zoo it is. Right, the morning it happened, I head that way to see if me old mum has finally had the place broken into. It was caught to five when I got there. That I'll swear on me dear old mum's life. I had a look round to see if the cellar had been taken. No. I had a little sit down on the stairs by the courtyard, because me shoes were causing me no end of pain, and I had a cut and all. I didn't see a single thing below the steps, Doctor. Not one single thing. If there was some bird all covered in blood, taint no how I could have missed that, even if it were night time. Right. Five minutes after getting to number 29, I had to clip off. And now they tells me that either I can't tell time no more, or I was fixing me loafer next to a stiff that was still steaming. Hmm. All right then, evening gents. I don't know what the hell he said. All right, let's see if we can find this trash can that they had the information in. This police station is like a laundry. What a scandal. Ah, oh, trash can. Here are the ripped statements. Oh, my God. piece them together again. All right. I'm going to break away and put this together because it might take me some time. I'll come back when I have it all pieced together. I didn't know I was going to have to do a puzzle. Well, a jigsaw puzzle. Okay, here's the last piece. There, all done. Holmes couldn't have done better himself. On the morning of the murder, the witness let, left her domicile at 32 Church Street at approximately 5 a.m. to get to the Sp Spitalfields Market. She was passing down Hanbury Street at about 5.30 a.m. The witness was certain of the time as she declares that she heard the clock at the Black Eagle Brewery on Brick Lane strike the half hour just before she entered the street. In front of 29 Hanbury Street, she saw a man and a woman talking. It should be noted that the witness identified the body of Annie Chapman at the morgue as being the aforementioned woman. This identification was solicited by our services. The man seen with the victim is described by the witness as follows. Age, at least 40 years old. Height, a little taller than the woman with whom he was discussing approximately 5 feet 3 inches. Clothing, brown deerstalker hat, dark coat, 
a doubt on this point. General appearance of the working class. Particular markings, dark hair and mustache, dark face, looks like a foreigner. The witness only saw the man from behind and wouldn't be able to recognize or identify him. The term foreigner is often associated with a person of Jewish origin. Well, there you go. Here's the second one. The witness resides at 27 Hanbury Street, the building adjoining number 29 of the same street, and the two respective backyards are separated by a wooden fence, tall and thin. On the morning of the murder, the witness got up at about 5.15 a.m. and went into the yard where the latrine was. It was then 5.20 a.m. On going back into the house, the witness heard voices from behind the fence, coming from number 29. The only word that he understood was no. He went into the building again, but returned to the yard approximately four minutes later, whereupon he heard a noise, as if something fell against the fence. He then departed for work. When he passed in front of the Spitalfields Church, it was approximately 5.32 a.m. Okay. Old Police Report Concerning Certain Arrests At gunpoint from the White Plum Mountain Inn, also called the Kayak Affair, five years, Dartmoor, Benjamin Benny the Scholar, Faggot 46, Hounds Ditch, Falsifying Bank Records Using False Bank Records, Misappropriation of Funds to the Detriment of the Royal Bank of London, eight years, Dartmoor. Jacob Levy, 30, Aldgate. Jacob Levy, 30, Aldgate. Theft of a weight of meat from his employer, Hyman Sampson. Butcher at 58 Golston Street, Whitechapel. 20 months, Essex County Asylum. Ron Obvious, 26. Address unknown vagrancy, embezzlement, indecent assault, Degradation of religious building to the de detriment of the authorities in charge of the Chichester Cathedral, City of London, Lunatic Asylum, indeterminate duration. James Longfoot Jim, Noser, 28, Whitechapel. An old report on arrests that took place a few years earlier. Okay, well... I guess we could talk to him. I don't think he's got anything to say, but... Yes, Doctor? I will take my leave, Humphreys. Goodbye, Doctor. Okay, after that, I think I'm going to take a little bit of a break, and when we come back, we'll talk to the policeman here and see if he knows anything more, and then um, we'll go from there. Hope you had fun. Hope to see you then. Ta-ta for now.